real talk. I've talked about this before, but okay, let's say you are the best man that she could possibly get. She cannot monkey branch away from you. She can't do better than you. I've been there. I've been objectively the best man she's ever going to attract. She'll still cheat on you. Like, even if you're the best man she's going to get, she has no desire to leave you for someone else. If you were to get married, she would not divorce you because she could not do better than you. That will not stop her from cheating on you because you've got to sleep sometime, you've got to go to work sometime, and she'll get bored and she'll cheat on you. Like, there are so many cases of women, married women, who cheat on their husbands. They're not looking to divorce their husbands, they're not looking to trade up, they're just sport fucking. They want to feel desired, so they cheat on their husband. They go on these dating apps. Welcome to my first debunking red pill extremism video. What you just heard is a quote from a video made by a red pill YouTuber. Within the video, he goes on to repeat this assertion two more times. I think that these ideas are inaccurate and that buying into this sort of thinking is harmful to men. That's why I want to examine their validity. It's especially important to do this because ideas like this are widespread and very popular in some pockets of the red pill community. The video that I'm specifically referencing has over 35,000 views and a thumbs up ratio of 98.7%. This is not some fringe belief. Evidently, a lot of people share this view. Though I didn't read every single comment because there are a lot of them, as I was scrolling through the comment section, I didn't find a single person disputing the validity of this idea. I'm going to break this down step by step. I'm going to demonstrate why this idea that women will inevitably get bored and cheat on you is not accurate. Before we get to that, let's just cover a few points first. Like I said in my original video, announcing that I'd be doing this series of debunking red pill extremism videos, I don't want to use anybody's specific names because I'm not interested in creating some clickbait YouTube feud. Ultimately, the person speaking the ideas isn't important. What is important are the ideas themselves, and it's essential that somebody engages with these ideas, deconstructs the arguments, and debunks whatever logic they seem to have. I think that it's also important to not use names because, for all I know, they have 20 other videos on the topic that give conflicting points of view, or they've since updated their thoughts on the matter. I can't possibly go through somebody's entire catalogue to check for that. Some of these MGTO YouTubers have hundreds or even thousands of videos in their archive, and a lot of them are just long, unedited monologues. So if this was intended to be some kind of hit piece on a particular individual, then it's absolutely terrible journalism, because I have not done my due diligence. And so, to reiterate, I'm doing this to purely debunk the idea, it's not about the person. In case anybody thinks that the quote is inaccurate, out of context, or that I've just made it up, I'll post a link to the original video on my Patreon page, so that people can go there and verify the accuracy of the source. Okay, so let's get started. This video is split into three parts. First, I'll explain why I'm skeptical about the claims made about his personal life. Second, I'll explore the validity of the idea that women cheat because they're bored and they want to feel desired, as well as examining the frequency of female infidelity. Lastly, I'll explain the psychological appeal that these sort of ideas have, as well as the type of person that's vulnerable to believing them. So, to begin with, let's look at the claims that he made about his personal life. I'm going to walk you through my thought process when I'm presented with information like this, the reasons why I'm skeptical, and why I don't accept what's being presented at face value. He says that, objectively speaking, he is the best man that these women were ever going to be with. They could not do better than him, and yet they still cheated on him. Now, in order to believe this to be true, you have to make a number of assumptions. The first assumption is that he's painting an accurate picture of himself, that he really is this high value guy. Now, that could be the case, but there are a number of reasons to be skeptical of this claim. One possibility is that he's just lying to boost his ego. Lots of people want to believe that they're this amazing high value person, and that's a lot easier to believe when you've convinced other people that that's true. Another possibility is that he's lying because he thinks that it drives home his point that women will cheat on you no matter what. He might have realised, quite correctly, that if he's a pretty average guy, then the fact that multiple women cheated on him could easily be explained away by the simple fact that he didn't satisfy their hypergamy. That's not the point that he wants to make though. He wants to undermine the argument that there's any kind of biological rationale behind why women would cheat on men. Women aren't cheating because they want a monkey branch to some higher value male. He wants to make the case that women are a lot more simple and irrational than that. So, he offers himself as proof. Trust me, it couldn't be their instinct of hypergamy that caused them to cheat, because, objectively speaking, I was the best man that they could be with. They were bored. It was just sport fucking. Because this is the point that he wants to make, I think there's good reason to suspect that he's exaggerated his claims about what a high value guy he is 
in order to undermine potential criticism. I don't know any of this as a fact, it's just speculation. I'm just giving you the thoughts that run through my head as to why I'm skeptical and don't accept what's being told to me at face value. To be honest, I think that the most likely explanation is not that he's consciously lying, but that like most people, he lacks self-awareness and is sincerely mistaken about his own value. They might genuinely believe that they're this amazing high value guy, but just because they're sincere in their belief doesn't mean that they have the self-awareness to guarantee that their self-image reflects reality. The second assumption that you have to make is that it's true that the reason that multiple women cheated on this man is just because they were bored. Relationships are complex and they involve a lot of different factors, and I'm automatically suspicious of anybody who explains away multiple cases of infidelity with a simple explanation of, oh, she was bored. My questions would be, were you a good personality match? Did you have the same life goals? Did you argue a lot? How often were you intimate? Before I could accept this explanation that the only reason these women cheated on him was because they were bored, I would need to hear their side of the story. That's a rule I have for almost every conflict that I come across in life. You might feel absolutely certain that you know all of the relevant facts, but withhold judgment. Wait until you've heard both sides of the story. Do your research, otherwise you might end up acting on your assumptions and look like a fool. Rather than just being bored, the actions of these women could be explained by hypergamy. They met a higher value man and wanted to sleep with him. I know that the original speaker definitely says that this was not the reason for the infidelity, but without knowing more of the details, I think it would be unwise to discount hypergamy as one of the possible motives. Of course, that doesn't excuse her actions. Having hypergamous instincts does not give you permission to go around monkey branching and committing adultery. That kind of behavior is appalling and deserves to be condemned. It's evidence of a low quality woman, which brings us to our third assumption. The third assumption that you would need to make before you could take this guy at face value is that the behavior of these women who cheated on him give an accurate depiction of the behavior of women overall. There are many reasons to be skeptical of this. The first being the small sample size. Even assuming that it's true that all of these women cheated on him because they were bored and all of his friends have the same story, that's still a very small sample size. When I hear somebody tell me, I've had multiple women cheat on me because they were bored and they wanted to do some sport fucking, my first thought isn't, wow, if that happened to him, then all women must be like that. My first thought is, dude, what kind of women are you dating? Now, I don't doubt for a second that there are women out there of the absolute lowest quality who would do this sort of thing. But why are you dating them? Instead of taking these experiences that you've had and then using them to make generalizations about every single woman on the planet, wouldn't it be more productive to your overall happiness to take those experiences and learn from them? Understand how you found yourself in that place in life where you're in a relationship with these types of women. I'm not excusing the behavior of the women in this instance saying that it's his fault that he got cheated on. The blame lies with the woman, but the idea that she's just a normal, typical girl and that things in the relationship were absolutely solid just doesn't hold up. There must have been some red flags that showed her character early on that demonstrated what a low quality woman she is. High quality women don't cheat, they don't lie, they don't risk their relationships with a great guy because they're bored and they want to feel desired. Those are the actions of a low quality woman. Out of your own self-interest as a man, I think that your time is best spent looking back on what those red flags were that you missed, educating yourself so that you don't fall into the same trap again. So those are the three assumptions that you need to make in order to accept what's being told here at face value. That he's really as great a guy as he says he is, that there were no other issues in the relationship that led to the infidelity, and that the behavior of these women that he has experience with is indicative of the behavior of women as a whole. As I'm sure that I've made clear by now, I think that there's good reason to be skeptical of all of these assumptions. This skepticism translates into my doubts about the conclusions that he reaches, that all women will cheat because they feel bored, they want to feel desired, and they want to do some sport fucking. So let's examine this claim and whether or not it's true of all women. The red pill is supposed to be about facts, about reality. And so I did some research to find out if there's any data to back up these claims. As it turns out, there is research that demonstrates that women feel bored in relationships. And from my reading of the data, there's a correlation between women feeling bored and infidelity. I'll post some links below for anybody who wants to follow up and look at the research. One study found that 38% of women and 35% of men felt bored in their relationships at least once a week. Where it gets really interesting with these statistics is where it shows that women get bored early in a relationship whereas men get bored later on. In the first year of a relationship, only 5% of men felt bored, compared with 11% of women. 
That's more than double. These statistics stay true between years one and three, with women doubling the number of men who feel bored at 22%. Perhaps the most telling statistic in the entire study was this one. When asked what the solution was to feeling bored in a relationship, 21% of women said that their solution was spending less time with their partner, as compared to 13.5% of men. I don't know about you, but I think that if a woman says that she's feeling bored in her relationship and thinks that the solution is to spend less time together, she's getting ready to monkey branch. Now, if you fast forward seven years on, you'll find that the statistics have switched that it's now men twice as likely to feel bored in a relationship as women. What this probably means is that for women, if they've invested seven years into a relationship without cheating, without leaving, then they're probably quite confident that they've found their top value guy, and so they're less likely to feel bored. The increase on the part of men is probably due to the Coolidge effect, the desire for sexual variety, which we've already talked about previously on this channel. I found these statistics really interesting, but I don't think they support the original claim that women are cheating on their partners out of boredom rather than hypergamy. I would suggest that their feeling of boredom is created by the instinct of hypergamy. The reason why so many women were reporting feeling bored in the early years of a relationship is because they're still doubting whether or not they can do better. You can see this trend on a graph of a different study, which shows that even though men are more likely to cheat overall, when a woman is young, between the ages of 18 and 29, women are actually more likely to cheat than men. Now, this could be because women get bored, but to me, this graph gives a very good demonstration of the different reasons why men and women cheat. Men crave sexual variety. It doesn't matter if he's married to the most beautiful and accomplished woman in the world, his biological instincts means that he will still respond sexually to other women. For women, their sexuality is more strongly linked to their hypergamy, being sexually responsive to the top man. So when I look at this graph, and I see that women in their 20s are more likely to cheat than men, the conclusion that I reach is that these women are monkey branching, exploring their options and trying to find the top value male that they can. Those women who are still committing adultery in their older years are probably that unavoidable statistic of low quality women, or women who feel like they bet on the wrong horse and married a guy of lower value than they really wanted. For men, as they get older, they get bored of the same partner, and that itch for sexual variety starts to kick in. Now, even though speculating about the different reasons that men and women have for committing adultery is quite interesting, the most relevant part of this research as it relates to our specific debunking purposes is that infidelity on the whole is not nearly as common as the author of the original video made it out to be. In another study, the figures that they came out with were that 23% of men commit adultery and 19% of women. Now, obviously this isn't good, Nobody should be cheating on anybody, but the research does not support this idea that women will definitely cheat on you. In fact, the data shows that four out of five women will not commit adultery. That's where I take issue with the claims made in the original video, because it paints women as these pathetic, desperate, broken creatures who are guaranteed to cheat on you because they're so desperate to feel desired. Yes, there are some women like that. Those are low quality women. There are also low quality men, and it's an unavoidable fact of life that a sizable portion of the human population are pretty terrible people that you never want to associate with. But to look at the behavior of these low quality women and then somehow suggest that that's indicative of the behavior of women as a whole is intellectually dishonest. It's exactly the same as looking at male rapists and male child molesters and then somehow suggesting that all men are like that. It's not accurate and it does nothing but fan the flames of division and tribalism. So if you're exposing yourself to all of this red pill stuff, and you're hearing fascinating ideas that relate to female psychology, if you're also hearing claims like this mixed in amongst it, please remain skeptical. It might sound like you're accessing secret knowledge archives that men are not supposed to see, the raw truth about women that only a small select group of men are actually strong enough to stomach, but it might all be nonsense. Fictitious claims made up by men not out of a desire to find the truth, but motivated by a completely different agenda. Now, it's not like there aren't legitimate discussions to be had surrounding female infidelity. For one thing, this culture tends to paint women as these perfect, angelic creatures who would never commit adultery. Cheating is only something men would do with their primitive sexuality and their low ethical standards. It's absolute nonsense and it's really harmful, and we need to break apart this myth that infidelity is some exclusively male phenomenon. What's worse is I've seen examples of women excusing the behavior of their female friends 
claiming that their infidelity and all of their lies and deceit were somehow an expression of female empowerment. If you ever hear women justifying the behaviour of some of their female friends, saying things like, well she had a right to cheat on him because she has a right to be happy, or he wasn't meeting her needs, call her out on it because it's absolutely ridiculous. There is a very important discussion to be had around female infidelity, and what bothers me about claims like, women are guaranteed to cheat on you because they all just get bored, is that it undermines the efforts of those seeking to have a real conversation about this issue. Women cheat more than the culture acknowledges, often for shallow and superficial reasons, and because they're women, the culture does not condemn them as strongly as it should. Isn't that enough? Do we really need to add straw man arguments and paranoia to the conversation? treating every single woman as if they're collectively guilty for the actions of some? For one thing, this kind of extremist rhetoric severely limits the number of men who are going to be entering into the conversation, and that's a missed opportunity. If you say to a man, bro, these women, they, they get bored, you gotta understand they're guaranteed to cheat on you because they want to feel desired. Well, if he knows high quality women in his real life, and he's absolutely certain that they're not the types to commit adultery, then he's gonna stop listening to you. If somebody has real life, first-hand experience of women not cheating on their partners, then it doesn't matter how many internet articles or MIGTO videos you send him, he's not going to believe you because it contradicts what he knows to be true from his real experiences. Even if he's just gone online and done some basic research like I did, he'll know that it's not true, and by pushing these extreme claims, you're going to be excluding him from joining the conversation. So what strategy is left available to you if you're not willing to give up your belief that all women are guaranteed to cheat on you, but you still want to convince other men to sort of join your perspective, and you keep encountering this troublesome problem of, well bro, I know women in my real life who wouldn't do this sort of thing. What strategy can you then use to convince him? That's when you could make use of the conspiracy model of red pill ideas, pushing this perspective that every single woman is a practiced liar. And it doesn't matter if you think that you know a woman really well, there's this deep, dark, secret side to her femininity, which she will never share with you because you're a man. Look at how the original comments push this kind of paranoid, conspiracy-style thinking. If you were to get married, she would not divorce you because she could not do better than you. That will not stop her from cheating on you because you've got to sleep sometime, you've got to go to work sometime, and she'll get bored and she'll cheat on you. Women just can't help themselves, they're incapable of rationality. She will definitely cheat on you, and because you don't know what she's up to when you're at work or when you're asleep, you're never safe. According to this style of thinking, it doesn't matter that you've consciously chosen to only associate with high quality women, or that you've never seen any evidence of this kind of behaviour from the women in your life. All that proves is how much you've been duped, suckered into believing that women can show any rationality, that they can control their desire to cheat, or show any kind of genuine love for a man. When you enter into this kind of conspiracy mindset, and allow paranoia to take over, it's very easy to get entrenched in these kind of beliefs, and begin to reject any evidence that comes to you that doesn't confirm your worldview. That is a very dangerous place to get to, because once you've made up your mind, confirmation bias will take over, and you'll begin to drift further and further from reality. In the description box below, I've included a link to a cartoon that explains the backfire effect. It uses simple illustrations and a progression of logic to demonstrate why humans are emotionally resistant to new ideas. I highly recommend you check it out. Now, all of this begs the question, what kind of person is vulnerable to believing these sort of ideas? Well, the most obvious candidate is someone whose only experience with women has been that they've cheated on him. He'll be easy to convince because what you're telling him completely backs up what he's seen in his real life. Also, someone with little to no experience with women in their real lives can also be susceptible to this kind of belief because they have very little evidence from their personal lives to contradict it. I have attracted some criticism from people who say that I feature too many women on my channel, that women have nothing of value to say because they're all liars. Now, I'm not saying that all women are honest. Far from it. If you watch my series of Red Pill interviews, you'll see some instances of cognitive dissonance that are so obvious that it's funny. But just because some women lie, doesn't mean that other women don't tell the truth, or have good self-awareness. And I'll never get on board with this idea that women themselves have nothing to contribute to a discussion about female nature. It seems self-evident that people who actually interact with women in their real lives are in a better position to judge the truth about female nature than another man whose only source of information about women comes from internet articles and MIGTO YouTube videos. Now obviously both have merit, I'm not saying that you need to choose, but I am saying that if your exclusive source of information about women comes from the internet, 
you need to be extremely cautious because of confirmation bias. A lot of these channels specialize only in looking at the very worst instances of female behavior. Again, I won't name names, but I was scrolling through the Twitter feed of a well-known red pill YouTuber, and it was just article after article that they'd found demonstrating the worst of female behavior. Now, these things happened, I'm not disputing that. I'm just saying that if you read five articles a day that showcase the worst of female behavior, that's going to affect the way that you perceive women. That's what confirmation bias is. As a further demonstration of this, I've read comments on YouTube along the lines of, I used to think so-and-so was crazy, but the more you listen to him, the more you realize that he makes sense. Now, it's possible that that's true, that some ideas are genuinely complex, and it just takes a lot of time to allow those ideas to really sink in before you can understand where they're coming from. And by the end of it, they do make sense. That's absolutely possible. But I think what's more likely is that it's just confirmation bias. If you begin to limit the sources that are feeding you information, then by necessity, your worldview will also become limited. As your perspective becomes more and more narrow, and you're only introduced to information that confirms your pre-existing beliefs, then obviously the conclusions that are offered within that framework are going to sound more and more sensible. If the only time that you're exposed to female nature is through internet articles, which showcase the very worst aspects of the feminine, then you're going to start to believe terrible things about women. Which is why I always encourage men to talk to the women in their lives about red pill concepts, about the unique difficulties faced by men. What's the worst that could happen? Even assuming the worst case scenario, that you share some of your difficulties being a man, that you open yourself up and you're vulnerable, and she completely brushes your suffering aside, or worse still, she shames you for it, well, then you've just confirmed your belief that women really don't have any empathy for men. Nothing's changed, no harm done. Or she will show compassion for your suffering, and you'll have the enriching experience of connecting with another human being over something that you felt vulnerable about. Fantastic. Like I've said before, I've spoken about red pill concepts to many women, and almost universally, I've found that they have compassion for the unique difficulties faced by men, and that they confirm core red pill ideas. If your experience has been the opposite, that whenever you've tried to talk about this stuff, women have ignored or shamed you, well, the conclusion that I reach is not that all women are incapable of empathy, it's that you're hanging out with some terrible women. You need to go out and find some nicer ones. I know that it sounds like I'm blaming men here. Some woman was horrible to him, and the only advice that I'm offering is that he needs to find a nicer woman to spend his time with. Please understand, I'm not excusing her behavior. A woman who acts that way deserves to be condemned. And I'm not blaming men. I'm just not also absolving them of responsibility for the people that they choose to spend their time with. And I think that it's this message that men should take responsibility for the people that they attract into their lives that has attracted a lot of the recent criticism towards me from the wider community. It would be a lot easier to say, women are just broken. If your life sucks, it's not your fault. Women are 100% to blame. You got cheated on multiple times? Don't feel bad. Don't wonder what part you had to play in all of that. It wouldn't matter if you're the most alpha guy around. She'll still cheat on you because women are just like that. They get bored. That kind of red pill is not a bitter pill to swallow because it's not about reality. It's a drug. It's a red pill opiate, something to numb the pain. It provides an easy answer, a scapegoat. It gives you a victimhood status so that no further self-reflection is necessary. So now we have an ethical question. If you encounter some guy who's been used and abused by women, even though he did nothing wrong, he's a completely nice guy and only had the best intentions, what is the best way to help him? Is it to make him feel better in the short term by placing all of the blame on women and convincing him that he's just the innocent victim of these heartless, soulless, cruel creatures? Or is it to do the more difficult task, to educate him about the reality of the situation, every part of the situation, including those parts that he was responsible for? The red flags that he ignored, the concessions to crazy that he made, the fact that he settled for a low quality woman because he hadn't done the necessary self-esteem work to convince himself that he deserved someone better. I think that a true friend shows compassion, but doesn't give you easy answers. It might be easier to believe that everything that's wrong in your life is simply because women are so terrible, but buying into that kind of simplistic thinking is going to be harmful to you in the long term. There's no self-reflection, there's no growth, and there's no opportunity to learn from your mistakes. You should be striving to live your best possible life. Not for the sake of women, or not for the sake of anybody else, but for your own sake, because you deserve to be happy. Achieving that happiness and a successful life requires brutal self-reflection. 
and I would question the motives of anybody who's giving you easy answers and discouraging that self-reflection. Do they really have your best interests at heart? That's all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching. Once again, I want to reiterate that this video is not intended to attack any specific individual, but merely to debunk an idea. The person speaking the words that I quoted may have changed their mind since then, or if given the chance, would like to clarify what they meant. And so in fairness, I want to keep that person's identity anonymous. If you want to see the original video that I'm referencing, I've posted it on my Patreon page so you can see the full context. If you want to support me and you like this kind of content, then please consider making a pledge on Patreon. I post there every single day. We've got a wonderful little community over there and I'd love for you to join. Make sure to hit that like button. If you haven't already done so, make sure you subscribe to the channel and please leave a comment below letting us know what you think about this idea that women are definitely going to cheat on you because they get bored. Thanks so much for watching and I'll catch you again next time.